Hello. Well, welcome everyone. Happy Montana Ag Week. Uh, this week we're celebrating agriculture. Uh, Montana's farmers and ranchers and their many contributions uh, to our Montana way of life and the world. Tuesday I welcomed ag leaders here to the state capitol to talk about how we can better partner to strengthen Montana ag. They told me about improving conditions. Uh, we're thankful for the regulatory relief we've been delivering through red tape relief and the positive impact of a higher business equipment tax exemption. They also emphasize the need for continued research into ag products. Yesterday, I was proud to celebrate Ag Week uh, with, the, uh, with innovative ranchers in Belt at the McCafferty Ranch. I was also proud to join the next generation of Montana Ag leaders at the FFA State Convention last night in Great Falls. And of course, on Monday, uh, we celebrated Montana Meat Day, one of my favorite holidays. Uh, working with Montana's number one industry is, uh, working in Montana's number one industry is hard work. Uh, it takes a special kind of person uh, to get the job done, a person who embodies the very spirit of Montana. This week is about recognizing hardworking folks in our ag industry and how they make our state stronger. Montana farmers and ranchers work hard each day to ensure we have what we need and we'll keep working hard each day to make sure they have what they need. That's why I'm proud we deliver tax relief to our farmers and ranchers and all Montana families with the biggest tax cut in our state's history. It will help hardworking Montanans keep more of what they earn, providing a tax cut to Montana taxpayers at every income level. This historic income tax cut is a win for all Montanans, workers, families, seniors, small business owners, farmers and ranchers, uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, since it is Ag Week, there's one tax relief bill I wanna highlight. We're making it easier for small business, uh, farmers and ranchers to thrive by further reforming the business equipment tax. Uh, as they all know too well, they're taxed every single year for owning the equipment they need to operate their businesses. Building on our successful work in 2021, we're raising the business equipment tax exemption to $1 million for every small business in Montana. Taken together with our reforms in 2021, we're eliminating this tax burden for more than 5,000 Montana small businesses, many of them farms and ranches. Without the burden of the business equipment tax, small businesses uh, farms and ranches can grow their operations, they can invest in other businesses when they purchase equipment, and they create more good paying Montana jobs in their own operations. It's a win for all job creators throughout the state. It's a win for our local brewers too, uh, while they turn barley into beer. And it's a win for our farmers and ranchers going a long way to helping protect their bottom lines. And when it comes to protecting a bottom line, Nobody understands the importance of guarding against uncertainty better than our farmers and ranchers. In any given year, drought, wildfire, flood, hail, or un other unforeseen uh, disasters can threaten their hard work. That's why they save money, and it's why they buy insurance uh, to guard themselves against risk. It's prudent and it's necessary. It's no different than any other person running a business. I know this from my time in the private sector. We've always kept ample reserves to get through challenging times. Keeping a prudent reserve to guard against the unexpected is essential for farmers and ranchers, families, businesses, and for the state of Montana. Savings and insurance are to a producer what a rainy day fund is to taxpayers. Montana taxpayers trust us to be good stewards of their hard earned dollars. And I'm proud that our budget, built for hardworking Montana families, fulfills that trust. After returning $1 billion to taxpayers, we're using our surplus like any Montana family would. We're paying off our debt. We're repairing what needs to be fixed. And we're saving for a rainy day. Because there are risks that are outside our control, 
risk that could jeopardize what we're getting done for the people of Montana, and we must guard against these risks. I urge the legislature to pass our proposal to double the rainy day fund. Thanks to our conservative, fiscally responsible budgeting last session, Montana's rainy day fund reached record levels. But according to a recent study, Montana's rainy day fund still falls short of the national average for all states. It's also the lowest by far of any of our neighbors. Healthy reserves and strong ending fund balances provide a cushion for unforeseen emergencies, like a national economic downturn, additional inflation, or a natural disaster. They keep us stable and secure, even when facing unforeseen challenges. And they ensure the state won't have to consider raising taxes or cutting essential services if we have a downturn. That's why our budget proposes doubling the rainy day fund. And I'm urging legislators to get this funding bill to my desk. Let's get it done. As you know, there's a lot in our budget for Montana families. Building safer, stronger communities is another key pillar in it. We need to boost our law enforcement efforts to make our state safer. And we'll continue to support and we'll continue to support our heroic law enforcement officers serving in the line of duty. Because the brave men and women of law enforcement put their lives on the line each and every day. Unfortunately, there have been too many grave reminders of this recently. A string of violent crime within the last two weeks has threatened the lives of law enforcement officers and Montanans alike. In Billings, a police officer was shot and wounded over the weekend. And in a separate incident, a 25-year-old was shot and killed. And on Tuesday, police responded to yet another shooting in Billings. In St. Regis, an armed robber on the run from Idaho took a Montanan hostage, shot them while exchanging shots with the police. In Great Falls, there were two fatal shootings in the span of just 36 hours. Since February 21, there's been five shootings in Great Falls, including one involving Great Falls police officer Tanner Lee. Thankfully, Tanner is making a recovery, but I ask for everyone's continued prayers for his well-being. Those who serve and protect our communities need support right now. That's why I spent time yesterday with Cascade County deputies in Great Falls, breaking bread and hearing how they're doing. They were thankful to be recognized. They are dedicated and devoted professionals. I enjoyed my time with them. And on behalf of a grateful state, I told them that we appreciate you and we are thankful for you. Unfortunately, violent crime is not unique to our communities. We're seeing it throughout our country. Its impacts are far reaching on our children, on families, and on our communities. Without question, this crisis requires urgent action from all of us. To make Montana communities safer, we've made addressing this crisis a top priority. Over the last year, I've hosted eight roundtables on public safety throughout the state. At them, I heard from local officials, law enforcement officers, treatment providers, and nonprofit leaders. They told me what's working and what's not, and how we can partner to make our communities safer and stronger. We've also worked closely with Attorney General Knutson. What we heard has informed our budget for Montana families. To ensure that we're cracking down on criminals, our budget supports law enforcement. Our budget funds new highway patrol troopers, prosecutors, and criminal investigators at the Montana Department of Justice. The criminal investigation agents will focus on drug trafficking, human trafficking, narcotics, major crimes, and crimes against children. And the new highway patrol troopers will combat violent crime and strengthen our drug interdiction programs. Now more than ever, it's critical 
that we properly fund law enforcement so they can do their jobs and ensure Montana families are safe. Unfortunately, the budget bill that passed the House does not fulfill our full request for public safety. We budgeted for five new highway patrol officers. The budget includes zero. We budgeted for four new human trafficking agents. The House passed a budget that only funds two. We budgeted for three new major case investigators. The House passed a budget that funds zero. We budgeted for three new narcotics agents, and the House passed a budget that only funds two. We budgeted for seven attorneys, including prosecutors, and the House passed a budget that only funds four. Let's be clear, combating violent crime and building safer, stronger communities will take investments. The last two weeks proves this. Our budget makes those necessary investments, and I urge the Senate to restore the new Highway Patrol troopers, prosecutors, and criminal investigators we proposed and honestly need. Government's chief responsibility is to keep citizens safe, and I call on the legislature to act with the urgency that this requires. Let's get it done. I look forward to getting this funding across the finish line so I can sign it into law and get these resources to law enforcement. And with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Um, I can go first. Holly? <laughs> I, I'm wondering about, I was watching the House Bill 835 um, here this morning. I wanted to ask a little bit about, I know the Deputy Budget Director talked about putting that money there versus House Bill 2 or supplemental because it felt like more transparency onto it. So I'm wondering if that bill passes, what kind of efforts would you like to see from the State Health Department to reduce spending in the state hospital or the Medicaid case there as possible? And what kind of reporting you want to see to track so there is that transparency piece here? Yeah, well, we owe transparency to the people of Montana. And just I'm not as familiar with the specific bill numbers and the pieces of the budget. Uh, I think that uh, the investment we've proposed for the, the state hospital is really historic. It's, that's a can that we've kicked down the road for way too long. That's why we allocated $300 million, and, uh, both to rebuild Warm Springs, but also to bring back community-based mental health. If you had a more specific clarification question, I could address that. shortfalls, both cost of running warm springs, and we talk a lot about contract staffing and all of that, and then maybe some higher than expected cases of Medicaid is like a much smaller chunk of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think concerns we heard from some lawmakers was, you know, while it's part of Hospital 2, it's looking at this upcoming budget year, and their response was, we think this is a more transparent way, we think this is very different, not yeah. the standard, so. So I think on the specifics of which bucket it's in, I would defer the question to the budget director. We'd be happy to get your follow-up on that. I just, from a priority perspective, we need to rebuild the state hospital. We need to upgrade the facilities. We need to bring back community-based mental health. Uh, and we need to make sure that safety net's there for the people that need it. Yes? Um, in talking about um, the public safety funding, and uh, I know, too, in past press conferences, You've talked about wanting the legislature to also pass child care tax credit, or excuse me, child tax credit, um, some disaster relief funding. I'm curious, just speaking broadly, in your conversations with lawmakers, why they haven't been voting to meet the executive budget there, and if they've given you some reasons for, for why they're spending less. Yeah, so we had a historic surplus in large part because we were fiscally responsible last session. Our top priority was give it back. We did that in the tax relief last week. I think in my mind there are two additional buckets of spending that we have to get over the finish line. One is saving for a rainy day because the tax cuts are great. Uh, I can't control what goes on at a national level with inflation and federal spending, uh, economic downturns. 
And just as I mentioned in my remarks, Montana families, business owners, everybody has an insurance policy and they have a rainy day fund. Ours are not sufficiently funded. So we need to get the rainy day fund funded in case there is a downturn. Unfortunately for the legislature, if we're not prepared for unforeseen circumstances, it could put us in a difficult situation of having to roll back the tax reductions or possibly cut essential services, neither of which I'm supportive of. That's why we need the reserve. And then, just like any Montana family would, we have some things that are broken in Montana. You know, a family might patch the roof, put in a new water heater. Uh, we have some issues with mental health. That's why we proposed $300 million there. Uh, the state prison, we need more capacity uh, and we need to upgrade those facilities. That's why we proposed $200 million there. And then the, uh, to make infrastructure dollars available for workforce housing through, because there are no programs in the state right now that allow municipalities to put in water and sewer for new subdivisions. All the existing programs are to replace existing ones. And I, I think it's a little ironic Given these needs that the state has and the priorities we've laid out, uh, we, I haven't gotten those bills yet, but the legislature did increase their pay by 30%. So I think that's a stark contrast. I, I'm glad they recognize that inflation exists and they have to take care of themselves, uh, but we need to take care of the people of Montana. Can I say a quick follow-up? I just am curious as to how optimistic you are to get those additions on in the Senate and if you've been working with the Senate on that. Um, we have good dialogue ongoing. I was frankly disappointed that they cut the public safety portion of our budget, especially with the episodes we've had over the incidents we've had over the last couple of weeks. I'm asking them here today to put those back in the budget. Do you have any questions online? Okay. Kind of following on your answer, I want to share this question. Is deciding the legislature pay increase? Is that on, if I remember, I was still kind of looking through, but you do have I'm curious, I know you don't generally comment on what you're going to do with those. Um, and if you want to do, I want to ask, but I also wanted to know if you feel like that's, you've done a lot of work with pay increase for state employees, and state employee pay plan, and warm springs, all of that. I'm wondering if you feel like what the legislature's doing is sort of similar to that for their side, or if you have concerns about some of the things you've seen there. Well, we'll look at each bill as it gets to me. But I, I would say on that particular bill, you know, we put money back in Montana's pockets last week with a billion dollars of relief. And I'm glad the legislature recognized that inflation is real. Uh, with this bill, they're putting more money in their own pockets. Uh, I'd like to get the work of the, pe the people's business done first, however, uh, around, uh, but I have to deal with the bills as they come to me. Uh, but uh, my priority has been clear. We need to fund law enforcement. We need to rebuild Deer Lodge. We gotta get our mental health stuff done and we have to provide for workforce housing. Those are the priorities. Other questions? Jonathan, no? Okay. I've got one. Okay. Holly, it's good to see you two weeks in a row. Representative Bill Mercer in the debate I once spoke to yesterday when they were talking about the course of the get your Arizona prison transfer. It was sort of a double negative statement because he was saying the administration doesn't not not support. So he was indicating that there was administrative support for that plan. So I just wanted to clarify things. I know we asked last week, and you're saying that's a legislative decision. But since he put that out there, I just wanted to ask it. We have to have a place to put inmates that are safe, both for the correctional officers and the inmates. We do not have enough capacity in Deer Lodge. That's why we've made it a, a priority to put $200 million into rebuilding Deer Lodge so we have the capacity here in the state. Uh, again, it was a legislative decision to, to send some prisoners out of state, but we need a place to put them. Uh, the long-term solution is to have appropriate facilities here in the state, and that's why we've made funding Deer Lodge a priority. Good. Anything online? Yes, sir. Great. It's good to see you all. Thank you very much.